All right. Welcome to the Thermal Review, the podcast with the latest insights on thermal imaging and its diverse applications. Today, we delve into process variability and its impact on thermal seal inspection in packaging and bottle cap applications. As many know, process variability can be a significant challenge in manufacturing, especially when ensuring product quality and consistency. In the context of thermal seal inspection, variations in the sealing process can lead to defective seals, compromising the integrity and safety of the packaged product. Fortunately, with the help of infrared cameras, it's now possible to detect to detect these defects quickly and accurately. By capturing the thermal patterns of the seal, these cameras can identify areas of uneven temperature distribution, indicating a faulty seal that needs to be addressed. So, if you're involved in the manufacturing or packaging industry and are interested in learning more about how thermal imaging can help you improve your quality control processes, this episode of the Thermal Review is not to be missed. Stay tuned for an in-depth discussion on process variability and its impact on thermal seal inspection. In today's episode, we have a special guest with us, Mr. David Ritter. Welcome, David. Hello. Or, 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 <laughs> should, or should I say, how's it, how's it going, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's better. Yeah. yeah that's better, eh? I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I say that because... Uh, well, Dave will give some background, but we also have Mr. Marcus Terran with us here as well, President and CEO of Movie Therm. Good day, Marcus. Hello, Dave. How is it going? <laughs> it's 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 going well. I it's it's good to be here today and in this uh, uh, podcast episode. Uh, this is episode twelve, and uh, we're thrilled to have Mr. Ritter here with us. And Dave, I was wondering if we could start off, if you could give us a brief introduction, a little bit about your history. Okay, well, um, as you uh, as you sort of uh, hinted in the <laughs> introduction, there, I, I grew up in Canada, and uh, I, I've been involved in all kinds of industrial things over the years. So I guess uh, process variability is something I've seen in um, several different contexts over the years. Uh, you know, going back as far as in my college days up in. Uh, Syncrude up in uh, northern Alberta, the tar sand plant up there, and uh, you know all the way up through. Uh, you know, in in Alberta, it's all about uh, uh, chemicals and petrochemical industry. So there's a lot of process, uh, you know, um, variability uh, analysis and understanding that goes on to try to squeeze every little bit out of uh, what, what they're getting through chemical processes. So that's mm. sort of my first, my first experience with it, but uh, you know, getting more into the software end of things later in, in, in life, uh, you know, and in, in inspection systems, of course, with Marcus here and, and other types of inspection before I came here, uh, process variability was always a, a factor. So something we, we'd like to understand, it's something we like to minimize. And uh, when you do that, then you can start to get better results with your inspection systems. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, David. And you've been with Movitherm now, uh, how many years uh, uh, working with Marcus and, and the team? <laughs> I guess 14 years this year. Yeah. 14 oh, years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're almost a lifer. Yeah, that's right. I was, <laughs> uh, I was a different fellow when I joined. I was just a boy. <laughs> he did not have gray hair when he started <laughs> is, is that right wow or, or this whatever this is i didn't have that either <laughs> I, I still had hair when i started <laughs> that's right well dave i know you're a pretty humble guy but uh rumor has it that there's a, even a book out there circulating uh, and I think if you go to Amazon, you can even find it, uh, a book that you authored uh, that has some ties to, uh, uh, what was it, LabVIEW and National Instruments. Uh. Yep, yep. That's, uh, that's one, of the, one of the detours I took on my journey was uh, <laughs> writing a book for McGraw-Hill about LabVIEW programming and uh, mostly the, the user interface context of LabVIEW and 
you know, making, making systems for users that, uh, you know, that's something a lot of times when you're in engineering, you don't necessarily consider the users that much, but, uh, you know, just doing the study for that, doing the, uh, you know, the investigation, the research to put that together. It was, it was a funny story. The, there was a, a fellow that wrote the first ever LabVIEW book and, uh, it was, I, I think I can't remember what it was called, but, um, his name was Gary Johnson and he, uh, I met him at, at NI week one, one year and I'm showing him some of my stuff and I, you know, I have sort of a graphical bent. I like graphics and, and that sort of thing. So my user interfaces had a little bit more of that than most people. So he said, Oh, I love your UI stuff. You gotta, you gotta write a book about that. So, you know, I, I had about a chapter of graphics stuff and I thought, well, yeah, that's not a, that's not a book anybody's going to want to buy. Right. So that's when I, I studied the psychology of, of user interface design and that sort of changed my perspective on how, how you approach writing software and, and uh, you know, keeping the end user in mind. And, you know, I mean, even what we're talking about today, it's really about delivering for the end users, for the people that are using our systems and making them work. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just a different aspect of, understanding users and understanding the needs of the systems. So, yeah, no, thank you, David. And you can get that on Amazon, by the way. So for our listeners who are, <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you're still getting a royalty, right? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, um, well, it needs a rewrite. Actually, we <laughs> talked about that uh, a few it years ago and it does need a rewrite. <laughs> yeah. It's been a few years. Let's dive in and talk about this, um, thermal seal inspection, and, and we're speaking of it primarily from a, the packaging, uh, I guess, perspective, if you will. I mentioned bottle cap and, and packaging in our in our intro. And uh, Dave, I know you're heavily involved with this. I know that because I work with you almost on a daily basis with, you know, solving customer problems with regards to what, what we're going to talk about here. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting, Marcus, if, if you could uh, share with our listeners uh, you know, just a description, a, 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 an explanation of what thermal seal inspection is. Yeah, uh, I mean, to us, it's uh, second nature, but I'm sure folks wonder what that really means. We, we call it short TSI, thermal seal inspection. And it's really um, the application of using thermal images to look at freshly sealed package seals and, and looking at the what we call thermal fingerprint, right? So they, they, what sort of in thermal imprint has been left on the ceiling area to determine has uh, the critical ceiling temperatures, have they been reached? Uh, often you have plastic against plastic and, and you want to kind of reach that, that glass transition area to make sure that you, you form a proper uh, chemical bond between two pieces of plastic, right? So you got to bring it up to the melting point and usually there's some pressure being exerted on the two pieces being pushed together. And uh, you have to make sure that the, the, you know, that the process is there, that, that it can reach reliably that temperature and then being fused together properly. And, and we do this really by looking at the physics involved and that's the temperature transfer of, let's say a heat plate or something, pushing these two things together. And then we're taking a thermal image and look at the temperature distribution, which we call thermal fingerprint, if you will, because there's a lot of variations in there and they're very uh, product and machine specific. And, and, and that's kind of where the big revelation typically starts to happen for the customer because usually they all they have as a feedback mechanism is really like they can either look at the seal when it's cold with your eyes and just trying to tag, you know, pull on the seal and see if it's or push the bag or something, see if there's a leak in there. Um, or the other feedback method is typically, hey, here's a thermocouple in, in the sealer. Yes, I have reached my 275 degrees or whatever it may be. And that's that's the feedback, but nobody really knows the truth of what really has been transferred into the bag, right? Because right. there's there's pressures involved, um, there's alignments, and and there's variations in the material thickness. Maybe there's some wrinkles. There maybe there's some part in seals. There's all kinds of reasons why that may not work properly, right? So that's kind of what what the the, the idea behind thermal seal inspection. Gotcha. Again, this is one of the beauties. I know, well, the, the name of the podcast is The Thermal Review, and part of our goal, our mission is to spread the word about thermal imaging technology um, 
And so Marcus, when you're when you're looking at these packages or, or bottle caps and things, you do get a thermal image, but you're doing more than just looking at a thermal image, right? Uh, in this in this, I guess inspection process. Maybe you can talk about that just just briefly, because it's more than just imagery. The imagery is awesome. Yes. Don't get me wrong, but right. Yeah, so the imagery is really great to look at as a human being from a qualitative sense, but we're really doing a, a quantitative uh, inspection. So we really base it on measurements, right? But these measurements um, vary really from application to application. They depend really on a, on, a, on a number of different variables. So the way we typically do this is we're, we're looking at the statistical distribution of the temperature. We're looking at the uh, locational distribution of the temperature because there may be some design aspects to the package. There may be a little bit thicker piece of material somewhere where the temperature distribution naturally is now changing because the pressure points are hitting the packaged material differently. And therefore, you, have, you may have a concentration or the absence of heat somewhere. And it may all be still good and still doing its job, but we have to recognize there is a variation there and that's either considered normal or it could be leading to issues, right? So we have to first take a statistical sampling of the of uh, you know statistically significant number of seals, and then we 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 tend to overlay the the that thermal fingerprint on top of each other, and then we're looking for kind of a corridor that forms in terms of spatial location, but also the temperature distribution, and then um, we get a a first glimpse at what is the process capability of of the sealing operation, um, you know how how capable is it of of repeatedly creating that same sort of a temperature corridor across that ceiling area. And, and then we use that to determine a feasible and reasonable sort of a reject um, criteria from there, right? So that's, that's kind of our process. Yeah. Okay, okay. This process variability though, it seems that that could be your potential enemy to being able to deploy a, a pass or fail type system on a, on a particular line. Um, Dave, what, what, maybe I could ask you this, what, what are some of the causes, uh, for process variability when it pertains to, you know, thermal seal inspection? That's my first question. My, my second question is how does that impact this whole ability to do this pass or fail inspection, uh, that, that, that TSI can do? Well, I guess, um, you know, we like to think of it as like there's two types of variability. There's like the built-in or common cause variability that's sort of built into the process. So these are the normal variations you can expect. And, uh, you know, these, these things might, might have to do with, um, you know, your supplier, you know, what, what's your raw material like, um, you know, how, how effective is your, is your equipment at heating up to the right temperature you know, is it, is it tightly controlled or is it maybe not that tightly controlled? And so now you've got some variation in, you know, what the temperature being applied to the material is. So, so you've got these, these built in, you know, uh, baseline variability, but, you know, so there's that, and then there's the exceptional cases. So ideally what you want to do is you want to dial in that, uh, that baseline variability as much as you can, because, if 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 your if your exceptional cases uh, are are happening within, you know the baseline variability, you have a you have a hard time detecting it. And and you know you earlier this week, Dave, you know we were talking to a customer, and that was the situation they were dealing with. Is is their their baseline variability of the seal was so so wide that the exception that we were looking for was buried in that mm. signal to noise ratio of just their just their their standard ex expected variation. So the first thing is to is to take this 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 background common case variation and 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 tighten that up as much as possible. And then once you've done that, uh, then when you have unusual situations like uh, you know a, a equipment breakdown, you know maybe you've got a, a problem where you've got an equipment malfunction and and something's just not you know maybe I mean if 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 you have a, a, a a heat platen or something that's not heating up at all. Well, that's that's an obvious problem. But maybe you've just got a a buildup of residue or glue or something on the platen, and now you've got a problem where it is warming up, but it's 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 not warming up to spec. And so these are the kinds of things 
that, uh, you know, an inspection system like we're, like we build, that's the sort of thing you'll see is, and if you have a nice tight, uh, you know, the variability of the baseline is, is not that wide, then when you have a, you know, one of these exceptions, it's going to jump mm -hmm. right out and it's easier to detect. So we, we, we have an example. There's a, a customer that we had and they have, they have two lines and we installed an identical system on both lines. And one of the lines is dialed in. And, and when we install the systems, the, you know, the, the, the people in the plant said, yeah, we know this one's really, it runs really well. The other one doesn't run so well. And so identical inspection systems on two lines, and of course, the one that's dialed in, no problem. They, you know, the pass fail on that's just, it works great. The other one, it's all over the place. So they're having a hard time dialing it into a point where they can differentiate an exception from this baseline variability because they have so much baseline variability. So those are the kinds of things. And, and so, you know, I think for us working with customers, if we can help them understand their variability, what's causing it, uh, you know, what's, what's expected variation and how can they dial that in a little tighter? And then what are the ex exceptions? And then, you know, once, once we understand those things, we can, uh, we can flag those exceptions a lot more easily. And then, mm. I mean, just generally for an inspection system, these are, these are the things you, you're looking for you in any type of visual inspection system. So, uh, you know, that's, I, you know, I'm not sure if that gives you, if that really answers the question, but that's sort of the background that we're working from. No, it helps. To, it helps a lot. Systems. Yeah. Um, so for a guy like me, uh, the exception variability, that, that's where the defects potentially lie. Is that right? That's where, that's, that's where they are. And that baseline is just the normal yep. operation of the, the process, whatever it is. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. that's the case. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you have a variability where you're, where you're generating like 30% defects just on your regular process, that's, that's a problem that you need to address before yeah. worrying about, uh, you know, the inspection system isn't going to help you there. You, you have to solve your problem first. For sure. Yeah. Interesting example too. We've talked about that customer that has those same, you know, uh, two inspection systems on two lines, one doesn't perform as well. The other one does. And, and it has to do with the, the variability in the process itself. Uh, Marcus, how do customers, uh, learn about this, uh, baseline variability? How, or, or how can they learn about it? Mostly when we start the conversations and when we start deploying systems, it's really the first time they have, um, uh, sensory feedback of that variability because it's not visible. How, how do you measure that, right? Mm. It's very difficult to statistically measure a variability of that kind because, again, the, the very limited feedback they have is, is what's the heat plate and temperature based on a thermocouple or a few of them, and then the hope that, okay, that energy at that temperature did really get transferred, but there's there's alignment issues and there's pressures and then there's, you know, material and all those part transport and all those other variables there that are not being considered there. Right. So, so that's, that's really the, the thing. So we really look at our system has the ability to provide data that is all inclusive, meaning all of those variations are included in our data set, everything. Because right. we're looking at the final result of having a sealed bag or an improperly sealed bag or pouch or package, whatever. And so this is the first time we show them variability, including any sort of uh, things that went wrong. But we have to first, like, like Dave explained um, before, Dave Ritter, um, we have to first differentiate and learn how to differentiate the normal variations that are okay and expected versus the abnormal variations, right? And, and how do you take those two apart if, if we have in, in the data we have now that clumped together, if you will, right? Mm. So often there, there starts a bit of a confusion and then, oh, kind of a moment. It's like, oh, w why do we have that many variations in our process in the first place, right? So that's where we come in with, with our, you know, 20 years plus experience and kind of help the customer like, 
understand and decipher what they're seeing there, right? Yeah. And say, look, um, again, I mean, there's examples where we come in and, and their process is already pretty tightly controlled and there's no issues there, right? And then it's fine. We have then a pass-fail system and then it's just responding with the reject when their tightly dialed-in process happens to drift apart. Um, that could be, like like Dave said earlier, it could be a gumming up of the heat plate you know, or something where the heat transfer mm. no longer is guaranteed. And the thermocouple is not going to tell you that because the thermocouple sits inside the heat plate and next to the heating element, and it's it's measuring what it's supposed to measure. It can't measure that that heat, that energy is now not getting properly transferred in the package material because there's no feedback there until we come in with a thermal camera and say, like, hey, well, it really didn't get transferred properly. So so that's really the, the, the big aha moment there. And then the, 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 the conclusion from that needs to be that oh, okay, we need to first work on the variations and tuning the machine in better. Maybe it's a pneumatic pressure issue, right? Maybe it is a, a, a PID loop on, on, on the heater that's, you know, because we're transferring energy, there's now an error component in, in, in that control loop that says, hey, I lost energy, I got to make up for it. Well, if the heating elements are undersized, they're gonna that heating element is gonna struggle to to make up for it until the next bag comes in and the next bag is being sealed, right? So you can create variations and and kind of like an oscillation in that loop now because it's not being able to put enough energy in before the next bag comes for it to take some energy away. So but who knows? I mean, there's so many different variabilities there, right? So but the important thing, the important takeaway for the listeners here is to understand like. If you do not have your process properly tuned in and stabilized, how can you expect mm. a good quality seal to come out on the other end? Like you can you can you can do that and, and just blindly trust the process and then say, okay, well, we have that, therefore we have the pass fail quality inspection system at the end. But really, then it becomes just a glorified garbage collector, right? Then it just says, Okay, I'm just gonna throw out the stuff that doesn't pass. Well, I don't think anybody's going to be happy if, you know, five, ten percent of the product you're running is going to be discarded now because, you know, you can't get your process under control to to create good quality in the first place. So then, what are you left with? You you can you can loosen up the reject criteria, but now you're running the risk of slipping through bad seals. That doesn't help anybody either, right? So, the answer is is, is not to to quote unquote blame the inspection system. The answer is like, well, what is causing this in the first place? Let's, mm. you know, the the continual process improvement under ISO and and, and those kind of things, nine thousand one, and you have to continually improve your process, and that that also goes for sealing, right? So you have to tune this in, and now you have a wonderful tool that provides you with that feedback to kind of to kind of tune that in. Right. Nice. So, and then once you have that tightened up, now we have a system, and now the system becomes even more valuable because now the system can actually give you an early warning indication. If you if your heat platens are starting to gum up, guess what? Now it becomes a predictive maintenance tool that says, "Hey, you have a couple more days left before you have to shut this down, um, you know, and 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 clean this up." Now you have an early trend indicator for like, "Hey, this is happening." It's not. Too bad yet you're not going to be having bad seals coming out but guess what if you let this drag for another two or three days you will so now it becomes really valuable because who who likes unforeseen shutdowns that nobody likes that right but if you if you can schedule that in into your regular maintenance and cleanup routine then even even better for you right so that's really understanding the full value and the impact of having a tool like this is very important and not just looking at it from the perfect uh, scenario and like assuming everything is great until it isn't it's really you know it, it's the the ability to also help you with process improvement i think is very important yeah no that's excellent yeah, it's, a, it's a window it's a window into your process that you wouldn't otherwise have you know and i i think a lot of times people they they come to us they want a pass fail solution but they're kind of missing out on the real, the real power and the real advantage of something like this is not just telling you, okay, these are the ones you have to throw away, but it's a tool that where you can you can make changes to your process and observe the outcome. Whereas, you know, if if you don't have something like this to to get the feedback, to get the numerical data, you know, you're just dialing things in, and some one operator says, oh, I did this, and it seemed to be better. 
And then everybody does that for six months before they realize, well, that was, you know, it just happened to be warmer that day. And so the bags were coming in warmer. And so it was working better when the guy did that. And the, the truth is it, it didn't help. So what's nice about the, the, the system is you have that data. So you can, you can work with that. You can, you know, review the images, try different scenarios. What if scenarios with our, our tuning tool and then do, you know, run different outcomes, see what the different outcomes would be statistically with different settings. And, uh, and you can actually start to see, okay, we're, you know, our, our variability of temperature over, uh, uh, say a, a four or five day period in this period of time was better than it was when we were doing something differently hmm. and all of, you know, you have the pass fail, but you also have all the data that, that we collect as well. So that, you know, helps with this, this improvement. Yeah. So let's say, let's say I'm, I'm a customer and, um, and yeah, it's revealed that, oh my gosh, I have baseline variability that is so broad that it's going to make it very difficult for that, you know, exception variability or for me to, to, to have a, a, an effective pass fail system without throwing out everything as garbage as Marcus described. What, how, how does, how do I, as a customer work with Movitherm, uh, to, to, to narrow that down? Do I have to do this on my own? Am I installing a system and just like, tweaking and monitoring things to see how it works. What does, what does that look like? And I, I guess Marcus, maybe to you, what, what does that look like for me, the customer who, oh my gosh, I did a feasibility study. It revealed, you know, I've got this variability. What do I do now? Am I on my own? I guess is what I'm asking. No, not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> okay. Um, so Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's really, that's really our added value here, right? We're not just leaving our customers alone with here's your inspection system, knock yourself out kind of a thing because it, it, it can be overwhelming at first because, you know, again, we come in with 20 plus years of, of thermographic imaging experience and, and, and package sealing experience and all those kind of things. So um, we're, we're here and, and we have as much of an interest in making this successful as the customer itself because we want to solve uh, solve problems out there. We don't want an unhappy customer out there. We want our stuff to work and help improve things and, and help save money with automation, right? With automated inspection. So so we, we have a vested interest to make this work. Um, we, we also have our 100% success guarantee with that, where we're saying like, look, this, this will work or we're not gonna be doing this, right? Um, but we also look at this more of a team effort with the customer together, right? So we're not gonna, hey, here's our inspection system and there you go. It's like, no, let's let's do this together. Let's figure this out. Let's make you make better package seals. So the way we do this is we're, we're, we can use the same technology, the same uh, controller, the same thermal camera that provides us later on that the pass fail sort of an inspection can also start collecting these images and the statistical data and and we we can then transfer that data and we can help analyze um, and we often analyze this for the customer and we analyze what's what's happening and if we do see a concerning amount of variation and again it's not that every system and every customer has these issues is it but there are sometimes hmm. surprisingly large variations and they, they should be addressed you know what i mean like i mean because it's the root cause of creating bad seals in the first place like why wouldn't you want to address that right because your yield is going to go up you're going to you're going to make more money at the same input of putting product in you're going to make more money if, if you're cranking out six seven percent more good parts i mean that's a that should be a no-brainer right so we help the customers with that um and analyze this whole thing and then if we see something for instance uh we had an application where the 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 left upper corner was like a rectangular seal and the left upper corner was always colder. And we're like, what's, where's that coming from? And we started investigating this with the customer and everything else. And they had a cooling pipe running really close to the ceiling area. And it was actually close enough to cool down the corner of that heat plate. Mm. And then and there was this big aha moment. I'm like, oh, so the customer put in a little shield, like cold sheet shield, if you will, and rerouted that, that cooling pipe there was cold water running through and and problem solved 
you know, and, and it happens to be that that corner sometimes didn't adhere properly and it was causing a leaking package. So th those are the things that we help uh, identify. And, and it's almost like a, not almost, I mean, it's a, it's a forensic tool to actually see what's, what's going on in your process. Like what's, what's happening? Why is this over there? Why is this always a weak bond? Like, why is this always a little bit colder than all the other stuff, you know? And then we, we help um, address that with the customer. The customer makes modification. Then we look at the data then thereafter. We're like, Hey, did it address what we found or did it not, you know, and maybe it costs yeah. something else. So, but we can totally have that feedback and, and help the customer to achieve a better and tighter process. And I think that looking at the data is where David, you get involved, right? I've I've seen some of the analysis and work that you've done on some of these studies, where we've uh, looked at uh, a customer's uh, process captured thermal imagery, and then you do all your magic, and I, I I see all these different charts, standard deviations, and uh, you know variations, um, but that means something to you. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it makes makes nice graphs. <laughs> but it does it does tell you what's going on. It's good. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the the you know, the the population studies, you know, they don't tell you that much about individual cases, but they give you an idea of what's happening over a, you know, a a, a large number, which is really what you know, you're, you're dealing with when you're in, in production environment, it's, it's what your statistical yield is the most important thing. So it, yep. these are, these are useful tools for, you know, understanding when you're making improvements, that's where you'll, you'll see it in there. Got it. And if you, if you have a, if you have a, a narrow distribution, that means you're doing well. And if you have a wide distribution, that means you're all over the place. And so that's what you're trying to do is tighten that up. Making that as skinny and tall as you can. So, yeah, <laughs> I like that. Well, we're near the close of our of our podcast here. Um, there, there's a couple things that I wanted to to ask you guys, and that was first of all, well, first of all, if you have any, you know, final comments uh, regarding this discussion we've had here, anything that we may have left out that could be, you know, valuable to our listeners when it comes to this. I'm going to continue to call it baseline variability now, and and exception variability, but any any final comments uh, or remarks regarding that? I guess Dave will uh, will start with you. Yeah, I I think the thing is for you know people to understand you know understand that they have variation that's normal, but they need to understand how much, and uh, they need a way to measure that. You know, I mean, you can say, well, we got lots of variability. That doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so a tool is what you need to help you measure. I mean, you don't you don't you know, build something for your house without a tape measure. You know, you, 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 you know, you just go and start cutting wood and then put it together and expect you're going to get a, get a usable table out of it. You'll probably find that you don't, you won't. So, so the, the, the key is you, you, you need to start with a tool that helps you measure and, and, you know, the thermal cameras are a great tool because they provide a lot of data. It's a lot of data points there's a lot of information. And like Marcus says, it's kind of, it ca if you put it at the end of all of this stuff, it, it uh, incorporates all of that information into, mm. you know, a, a hard record of what's going on. And so then if you start making changes, you can start to see, okay, what is the impact downstream of, of these changes? And you can dial it in and say, okay, I think, I think we've got a problem here. Let's, let's try to tighten that up. And if you see it on the back end, then okay, yes, you're moving in the right direction. If if it's not changing or it's getting worse, well, then you know that that, that either you have to stop doing what you're doing or that's <laughs> yeah. not where your problem is. So, so, but I mean, th this is one of the great things about, you know, the technology and a the thermal camera. There's a, you know, it's, it's like a whole bunch of thermal couples, yeah. you know, in one package and it's all ready to be analyzed as one you know, unit of information. So it's, it's a very powerful tool for sure. Yeah. Thank you, David. Mr. Yeah, Karen. While, while we're on the, while we're on the an analogy side of things, one, <laughs> one way of, of looking at this <laughs> would be also like, uh, let, let's say you're following a recipe, baking a cake, right? So it says, Hey, put this cake on 325 degrees for one hour. And so you're setting your oven up and then, um, you know, every time you bake a cake, it comes out different. And you're like, 
wait a minute, I, I followed the recipe to a T. I put the oven on 325. Why am I not like, am I not a good cook? Am I not a good baker? Like what's going on? Right? Because the feedback you have often is at 325. Well, what if that oven in actuality varies between like 270 and 450 degrees while you're baking? And you're not seeing it because you're trusting that one feedback there. Mm. And so you get some cakes out there semi-burned. Some are like undercooked. And they just, you know, you just can't seem to get good cakes out of the thing. And, and the reason for that is because you have process variabilities, right? And that's kind of similar to, to what we see sometimes on, on these package seal applications, right? It's just uh, you, you trust one value there, but it's the reality is a completely different story. Right. So even if you put the right ingredients and in, you're just not getting the same result consistently out of it. Yeah. Wow. Great, great analogies, guys. I love those. And I like cake, too. So that was perfect. Uh, thank you. <laughs> 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 oh, well, um, that that's going to wrap up uh, this episode uh, for today. Um, David Ritter, thank you. Thank you to our guests for joining us. Uh, it was, sure. it was a, a wonderful having you here. Thank you for taking the time because I know you have a crazy schedule. So appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> Marcus, thank you. Thank you as well. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, thank you to our audience. Uh, again, we so appreciate you uh, joining us, uh, especially in today's episode. Uh, and hopefully uh, you, you walk away with a better understanding of the power of thermal imaging and how it can be a useful tool uh, in reducing uh, baseline and exception variability in, in a packaging process. So thank you to our listeners. As we always do, we encourage you to please uh, send us your comments. Uh, let us know if there's a particular subject uh, you're interested in, and we would love to cover that here on the Thermal Review. And, and don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform, and uh, also, uh, we're, we're posting new educational content all the time on our YouTube page and also uh, what we call our Thermal Tutor um, playlist. So please, we encourage you to check that out. So gentlemen, thank you for your time and thank you to our audience. Everyone, have a great day. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.